Hey guys, it's Mystery Man, and I present to you a very simple yet compact hard drive. So as you can see, the hard drive is a piston fetate design, which, yeah, doesn't that sound, it sounds kind of weird that piston tapes could be used this way, but they've been used as memory for a long time, like really long, but... The way this one works is quite special because this V-tape has two pieces of tape to represent one bit. So this is a zero block and a one block. And the way that I'm able to represent the data as a one or zero is by swapping those blocks. So right here I've got a block swapper and whenever I put in a number and hit the right wire. the blocks here swap and now the torch under there is causing this redstone line of power which causes this input to an X NOR gate to happen and now I'm gonna go ahead and show you what this all is about so let's go ahead and start with the we're gonna go ahead and start with our block swapper and you could use this design to make your own feed tape memory. So it's good. So you're gonna build the block swapper in this orientation, like so. And you're going to do this. And you need a block to represent a one or zero. So there we go. That's the main part of the block swapper, and then the next part is just a redstone torch here, and a repeater there. And right here, we will represent the rate wire. So this is a wire that connects to all of the cells, and it's used for rating. And then over here, just have this. I'll put this on three ticks as well. And now we can build the circuitry that actually determines if we swap a block or not. So the way I determine that is using an XNOR gate. So I first made an XOR. Well, I actually built an XNOR, but you could first make an XOR like I did here. And then I'm going to just take a target block and put a torch on that. And we're going to hook this up to that. And now this is effectively an AND gate because this signal's on and that signal's on. And when both of them are off, that's actually a NAND. Yeah, it's a NAND. But when both of them are off, then the output turns off and we can block swap. So if I want a value to go to zero, which I'll have our user input here. I also made a more compact XOR, but if we want a zero and we press the button, it won't do anything because the block's already zero. And now if I want a one, but we have the zero there, the block swap, and now it's a one. And if I try pressing the button again, it's not going to swap because the output of this XNOR is on, and therefore you can't write to that. So what I'm doing is I'm negating... I'm trying to negate the output is what I'm trying to do. And by negating the output, I could swap the blocks. So I'll go ahead and show you the XNOR real quick. So the actual XNOR, it's kind of tricky. I had to do a bunch of weird wiring to get this to work. But uh, this is the XNOR. So there's input A and input B. And input B is from that torch there, and it goes under and up a torch tower to that block there. And input A is the user input. And it does the exact same function that I just showed you there, uh, which causes this block swapper to go off when we click the right wire, which is this glass wire. So that's how the actual memory works. So this is effectively a D flip flop. And if you want this to be three wide, you need to stagger this over by one block each bit, like so. and. Yeah, just look at my model if you want to figure that out for yourself. 
But effectively, this is like the most basic uh, piston tape memory you got right here. Just a simple one bit memory there. And yeah, there you go, it just loops around. So, there you go. Um, and now, onto the actual functionality of the tape. Because I want you guys to see that it truly does work. Okay, so what I have here is the address counter. And what it does is it, it'll cycle until it reaches the address that's input in there. And the way it determines that is using an XOR because, and the XORs are all connected to an OR gate, and this makes a AND gate that can change at a variable way. I'll explain why. It's actually a NAND gate, but what it does is if that input is on and that input is on, the counter needs to match that input because if we do one XOR one, we get a zero. And if this line is all zeros, then the timer here stops, which is poor tick. But yeah. So that's how that works in a nutshell. But let's go ahead and store some memory. So I'm gonna store the number five on address zero. And I'm gonna go ahead and write to it. So right now we have zero we have a one actually because I stored a one for that demo. And now we got a five. So we got a five on zero. And now what I'm gonna do is I'll just go to some arbitrary address. Um this is one, this is sixteen. So one, two, three, four, I mean. So that's six in binary, and if I click the seek button, it stops exactly when that line turns off. And now we're on address six, and I'm gonna go ahead and input some number here, just so that we can see that it works here. I know that number, that number is 225. Okay, I wrote the number in. And now I'm going to go back to address 0, and that'll take some time. It should be under 13 seconds, though, so it shouldn't be too bad. Um, each of these piston tapes are rotating at 4 ticks, so yeah, you can do the math from there. But now we're back, and there we go. We got 5 at 0, and uh, if I go back to address 6... So now if I go back to address 6, it could be any arbitrary address, but we saved at 6. There we go, we got that number from before. So yeah, it does everything that normal memory should do. It writes, and it has an address tied to that register. So yeah, each of these, blo each of these blocks represent a register, so you can see why it's so dense now. Okay, and now you kind of notice that this is a slow device. Yeah, it's slow. But you get, you know, more memory. And that's just like a normal hard drives in real life. Normal hard drives in real life are slow, but they can store like ter more than a terabyte of data nowadays. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, this is where I'm going to get to that point, though. So what you could do is you can store massive programs in this tiny hard drive. But what you could do is you could send some of the program code to a cache or register bank to hold the data so it could be accessed faster. Now, another idea I had to make a very, very fast, well, not very fast, but to make a faster way to access the hard drive is to have them in blocks. So you can have like let's say four hard drives and you could tie them to the exact same address so pretend that this right here is the address line so we can have like one counter one counter to all of these so these all have the exact same address but guess what we're gonna do now um, right here oh, right here on the bottom you can literally have all of the outputs tied together and use a decoder 
to read from each of the blocks. So what you could do is you could basically build massive storage while being able to still access a certain amount of data at a time. So if I wanted this to be useful, what I could do, well, like more useful, I could have like eight of them in a line. And each of these could represent one register, but 32 of them stacked on top of each other. And therefore you can have fast access, but you can also swap the register basically to get a fresh one. So that's an idea. But that's all I've got to show. Um, there are similar concepts to this memory down in the description by other people if you're interested. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Now, before I go, I have been thinking about I've been thinking about a lot of things. I I haven't I haven't really had time to work on that core yet, so I'm putting that aside. I'm sorry. Um but I, I am interested in rest zone computing stuff, so maybe I'll do a simple tutorial series. Who knows? I, I can't promise that, though. And also the Pokemon streams. I'll probably do recordings as well as maybe some streaming. We'll see. Anyways, uh, take care, guys.